So, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, walking baselines and specifically vocabulary, right? Now, you might be thinking, what the hell is he talking about, vocabulary? Well, whenever you um, improvise, and let's face it, walking base is an improvised art, right? You can you can read, uh, you know, pre-composed ones and learn pre-composed ones, but essentially they're supposed to be improvised. Now, when you improvise, there's very much um, a kind of train of thought when people can't improvise that, that an improvisation is all just made up, that it's just absolutely every note is just coming, being drawn from the ether, you know, that you just m mystically you know, <laughs> bringing these notes down. But that's not true. So when you improvise, you basically utilize um, your vocabulary. You're like, now, the, there are various elements of vocabulary. It's not all just running. I don't mean licks. I don't mean that you've just got a bunch of licks. Vocabulary could even be understanding what an arpeggio sounds like. So over a D minus seven knowing that or knowing that with the passing note or you know that can be vocabulary you know it's understanding that um just as much as you know a line like that where you're coming down is is also vocabulary i mean it's and and the smaller elements of it just all the those small elements of it they all combine eventually over time just as when you learn language when you learn to talk you're not making up letters you're not making up words you're utilizing words and letters phrases sentences and you know expressing yourself so the stuff that i'm saying right now the stuff i'm saying right now the stuff i'm saying right now that line i've probably said it a million and one times or maybe not but you know, you all understand what it is. I'm expressing something. And in a conversation, you, it's the same thing. You're expressing something in response to something else. And that is what improvisation basically is. So you're utilizing the the words of music and creating, and, and creating sentences. But the sentence structure and how all of that works is, it's not rules, but it's just principles that you kind of, abide by so just even that line that i just played oops just like that just running down a scale with a with a chromatic node in it that phrase that's kind of like a sentence you know and you could play a million and one different things with that but that's what we're talking about with improvisation and vocabulary it's the same thing with walking bass now i talk about this at length as well in the walking bass course as well as all the chord tones and chromatics and blah, 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 two feel and to four feel and all that stuff um so let's have a look at some really basic vocabulary and what we're going to do is take a chord progression i'm not going to use tracks for it or anything like that because i want you to actually understand the basic notes that i'm using here and and be able to then take what i say and then just apply it out of time in your own time okay so we're just going to use a couple of phrases okay now i think i've done this on an old video at some point but so you'll have to excuse me if you've seen that one but i think it were about eight years ago so <laughs> who knows but um let's take a chord progression c major 7 a minor 7 d minor 7 g7 okay so this is going to be the same one that i use in the court in the uh, walking bass course all the time so this is going to be a one six two five in c major now don't worry too much if you don't know about harmony you don't know what one six two five means or any of that stuff but basically the chord progression is going to be this let me turn the treble up so you can hear it a bit better that's c major seven then a minor seven d minor seven g seven that if I was playing it two chords a bar, it's basically I got rhythm. So it's rhythm changes. Just a basic kind of turn around. So in playing that as arpeggios, but don't worry, we're not going to get too much into arpeggios. I could play it like this.
And you can actually hear the chord progression going by when you play it as arpeggios. So there's the C major 7, A minor 7, D minor 7, and G7. So that's where chord tones come in handy because you're actually outlining the chords, you can hear the chord progression in there, you know, all of that stuff, which I've talked about a million and one times. In terms of the scales, well, you could just use C major for it, but in terms of relative to the root notes, you'd have C major, A Aeolian or A natural minor, D Dorian, and G mixolydian. As the you know, as the chord scales. And again, if I just play through that again, just listen for the chord progression. And back. So. So it's all about outlining the chord progression. So where does vocabulary fit into all this? Well, instead of just playing around on arpeggios and trying desperately to put our, you know chromatic notes in there and thinking oh do i think our oh, chord tones do i think scales and trying to improvise it all the time think about it if, if somebody's just shown you a bunch of arpeggios and scales and says right go forth and play a walking bass line through that chord progression what the hell are you going to do i mean you could just play up through the arpeggios but that sounds naff I mean, it's just this, these fireworks being fired up into the sky, you know, it's just like going up, up, up all the time. And even if, you know, you, <laughs> even if you jump up, you know, then you're going to be stuck coming down, you know, just thinking of arpeggios all the time and, and, uh, and scales, you can run into problems. It, it just doesn't become smooth. But... Thinking of vocabulary, you're more likely to be able to come up with something like this, which we're going to look at. Okay. So, all we're going to do is look at a couple of lines here that we're going to move around to the various um, chords. Now, the first thing that you need to think of is root movement. So, think about what I said there, C major 7, A minor 7, D minor 7, G7. So just to begin with, just look at where the root notes are. C, so I'm taking 3rd fret of the A string. A, 5th fret of the E string. D, 5th fret of the uh, A string. And then maybe G, 3rd fret of the P string. So C, A, D, G. Okay. Or I could maybe go C and up to the A and then down to the D and up to the G and up to the C. But all we're doing is looking at the root notes. C, A, D, G. Forget about the chord qualities for now. What root movement have we got there? Well, we can actually look at the root movement as either an interval or just basically as a fretboard pattern. But if we look at the C, we're moving down by minor third down to the A. Okay, so... C down to the A. I mean, you can see it's that little pattern there. C and the A. Okay? You're basically moving from chord 1 to 6. That's what you really need to be thinking. Chord 1 to 6. Okay? But it's down a minor third. Or up a major sixth. So if you know your intervals, and you know your interval patterns, that'll make sense. So 1 to 6. Okay? Then, from that chord 6, the A, where are we going? Well, we're going to D which is here, it's that same fret, okay? Look at that interval. That's a perfect fourth. It's a fourth. We're moving up to the same fret on the next string. I'm trying to make this as simple as I can. A to D, A to D, fourth. That's a fourth movement. So that's what we're looking at, root movement. Yes, it's minus seven, minus seven, but don't worry about that for now. A to D, then D to G, or D down to G. Okay, but it's movement by fourth again. And then finally, G back to C. If I went up, again, look, it's perfect fourth. Movement by fourth is the most common chord movement in jazz. Okay, you get it all the time because you've got two five ones all the time. Okay, it's always movement by fourth. 
Now, if you come down, yeah, it's kind of movement by fifth. It's just an inverted interval, but don't worry too much about that. Basically, when you're looking at root movement, you really want to look at it up. Even though you might be going down, you're actually thinking of the root movement going up. So that's why I say C to A, you're actually moving by sixth, even though we're coming down a third, okay? So it's one to six. But then that A to D is movement by fourth. D to G, fourth. G to C, fourth, whether we move up or down, okay? Why is that important? Well, because when you're actually looking at the vocabulary, if you're scanning a chord progression like that, you can actually think, okay, I need a line using four notes. If, you, if you're playing each chord per, one per bar, if it's for several bars, then you've got to think of something different. But if it's one chord per bar, you've only got to make up four notes, right? Now, the first note is probably most likely going to be the root note. So you really only need three more notes <laughs> to get you to the next one. So if we're, let's, let's take the um, C to A, right? So we'll just, make, we'll just get a line that works over that to begin with. So we've got this chord one to six, and we'll do a descending one first. So what I'm going to use, uh, let's use this. C, B, G, G sharp, A. So we're getting to use a bit of chromatic um, chromatic movement. I'm going to put some chromatics in here to make it sound a bit more hip, right? So C, B, so this is going to be third fret A string, second fret A string. C, B, down to the G, the fifth of the chord. Uh, third fret E string, fourth fret E string, fifth fret E string. And we're at the A. Right? So we just took four notes. Root notes, we came down to the seventh, down to the fifth. So that's all chord tones, if you want to analyze it. And then we've got this little chromatic approach note into the A. One, two, three, four, and we're on the A. So we know with that line that we can go from chord one to chord six. That's vocabulary. We've got a line. You can just memorize that line like a lick knowing that if it's going to be called one to six, that works. And you can just kind of learn walking bass lines like this. If you want to get through what a walking bass line, you can just learn a few lines like this. And trust me, you'll be able to get by. So that's your chord one to six. So every time you see that chord one, when we get back round, we'll use either that or we might use an ascending one. So if we're going to move up to the A, Let's say we're going to move up to the A here. We could come up the arpeggio, C, E, G. So we're outlining the chords and then put another chromatic note into the A. So there I've played third fret A string, second fret and fifth fret D string, and then that sixth fret of the um, D string to move into the seventh fret. So um, there's loads of different ways that you can uh, fret this, you know, in terms of the fingering. Don't get too caught up in fingerings when you're doing walking bass lines because you end up moving all over the place. And sometimes you'll just be using like one finger. You know, don't worry about like, oh, it needs to be one finger per fret and all this. So I just played it like that. I just came up second finger, first finger, fourth finger, then first finger, and then second finger, right? Okay, so it's a little pattern that we've got. So we've now got an ascending line and a descending line to get us from C to A, chord one to chord six. And that will work no matter what the key. So if we're in the key of G major, and we want to get, so we've got G major, so to E minor, chord six, could play that, use that same pattern, or, okay, so we've got a pattern that works, okay? Like I said, chord tone scales, all of that stuff, you don't really need to know it for learning that line. Yes, it is using all of that stuff, and it is a better idea to actually analyze it and know what's going on. But even if you didn't, you've got a line. Now, let's think about what we're going to do from the A to the D. So if we're going to go from A to D, again, we need, we've got the A, the root note for the first beat. So then what we're going to do to get to that D? Well, here's the line we're going to use. We're going to use A, B, C, C sharp, D. This is the most common line you'll ever hear in walking bass lines. You hear it all the time. That's why I say it's vocabulary. And the more that you analyze bass lines, the more of these things that you'll learn. Okay, you'll, you'll see these lines because there's only so many ways of getting from A to D. 
<laughs> you know, smoothly. There's only so many ways of doing it. So, you know, if you see that Ron Carter played it a certain way or Ray Brown played it a certain way on a transcription, you might think, oh, there's a different way of getting down there. You know, or, you know, whatever it is. There's only so many ways. So, so this one's really, really straightforward. So here, I'm on the fourth finger there for the A at the fifth fret of the E string, and I'm coming up B, C, C sharp, D. So that's going to be second, third, fourth, and fifth frets on the A string. Dead simple. And I'm sure most of you have probably seen that kind of line before. You know, when you see this kind of thing. Any of you that have played in church, doing gospel stuff, you're going to see that kind of line. Um, so, A up to the D. And bear in mind, just a little bit of a technical tip, you want to make sure that those notes are all full held duration. So you don't want this. You want this. Ba, 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 ba. Okay. Now... That was on a minor 7 chord, but you can use it on a major chord or a dominant 7 as well. That's the cool thing about this line. It's pretty, it's multi-qualitative. So you can use it A to D. If that was an A major, it still works because you've got the major 3rd in there and you've just got this little movement of the... See, it, it works less well on a major 7th, to be fair, but most of the time you wouldn't have that... You, you wouldn't see it over um, major sevens that much because the chord movement's not going to happen. But minor seven works great. You've got the root, the second, that minor third from the chord, and then that's just a chromatic passing note to lead or approach note to lead into the D. So minor seven works great, and on a dominant seven, it works great as well because you've got the root, the second, neither of those matter. And then that's just a minor third to major third, which is that good old kind of... You know, that kind of, um, you know, that, that bluesy move. Well, there it is. <clears throat> and that's what you get if you play it over a dominant seven. So, so it, it works over several different ones. So we've got A up to the D. And then it's going to be D minor seven to G seven. So guess what? It's upper fourth. Let's do it again. And then we got G to C. Let's do it again. Which means that we've actually played round that chord progression simply using one line, well, two lines if you use the one to six. But that gives us, there's that line. Then we got this one. Now, on the face of it, if you were just listening to that, and I'd not talked about any of that, you'd not learned it, and you were just listening to that playing along with the band, you wouldn't be thinking, oh, he's just using that same line over and over again. Because it, it the chord progression is moving along. It sounds like one long line. But in fact... It's just that, that you're shifting up a fourth each time. Now, obviously, you don't want to do that for every single walking bass line that you're ever going to play in your life. <laughs> that is repetitive. But, you know, it's it's that's your first line. That That is the first bit of vocabulary. If, if, if you've never learned any lines like this before, this is your start. This is your vocabulary. You know, and like I said, this is used all the time. You will see this in most walking bass lines. So... We've got an ascending and descending line on the the one to the six, and then we've got this ascending line when we're moving by fourth. Remember what I said? It's all about the root movement. The quality comes plays a part as well. Obviously, you don't want to be out of, you know, you don't want to be playing, um, you know, something with a major second maybe when it's a, a, a when it's supposed to have a minor second, but over these chords one, six, two, and five. They work great. So just try playing round and round on those. Now, there is another cool thing that you can do with a line like this, and that's to get outside of the fingering that I've just shown you. So let's say that we've got A up to that D. Yeah, we've got that little finger pattern, but you could also work up the neck. I mean, notice how I'm kind of working down the neck. Uh, well, 
you know, my hand is down here. The, the I'm starting on the pinky, so it's everything's stuck in place below the hand there. But you can actually move up. So when you're doing that, from that A, B, C, C sharp to the D, well, you can go A, B, C, C sharp, D and work up the string, which gives you a different fingering for it. So for that, I might play 5th, 7th, 8th, ninth, and then 10th frets are on the D here. So I can just play it with the first finger and then just shift and then just play it like that. Now if I did that... I can start playing in this position. And then if I decide... Let's say, let's say I came up like this and then switched... That's the same, same line, it's this. But... You know, however you want to do that, you can get further up... Just using that single bit of vocabulary, because you've learned two alternative fingerings for the same thing. Okay? Now, you could do the same thing with that C down to the A as well, because, well, that, that one is a little bit trickier, okay? So if you were, you could play like that. To be honest, that one, yeah, you'd probably be sticky with that. But if you're coming up, do we have a different way of playing that? You could play, you could play that C, E, G, G sharp, A, so you're staying in one position, okay? It always pays to have a couple of different fingerings for it. Um, so yeah, so we've got multiple ways of moving up the neck. And notice how we got right up here. So um, let's say that I used the ascending line, that bit of vocabulary for getting from C up to the A. I could then continue. See, I'm just using those. It's the same lines. We've learned two lines that, well, three lines if you include the ascending one on the uh, on the um, major seven. But you know, I've just come up, so we've got that one C E G G sharp A, and then I've thought, okay, well, I'll use that one up here, but working up the string. Then, oops, and then if I get right up here, I could come down again on that C. And then we run out of frets, right? So this is the problem with only learning one type of line. You know, and, and let's face it, if you're going to be improvising, and this includes soloing, right? One of the main things that you are going to think about is, am I going to go up or am I going to go down? At the real heart of it all, you know, no matter what you're playing, you know, like if you're playing like a, a line coming down, you know, like a, just a scale coming down or, or whether it's going you know, whether you're coming up a scale, you know, when you're trying to think of what you're going to play, you have to think, am I going to go up or am I going to go down, right? So, when we started there, if I think, okay, well, I'm going to start on the C and I want to move up. Well, I've got an appropriate piece of vocabulary for getting up to the A, but we only have ascent for moving up on these ones by four. So, what we need is a descending line. So, this is where it gets a little bit trickier. I mean, I was tempted to just show you this. I'll tell you what, I'll show you that first and then I'll give you an alternative. So here's a dead easy one that you can use. So let's say that we've played up to the A, right? So we're on the A there at the seventh fret of the D string and we want to get down this time to the D. So instead of, instead of moving up to the D, we want to come down to the D. How are we going to do it? Well, there's two different ways that I'm going to show you. We could go down a scale, and here presto, when you play it down on a scale and you're working down there, that lands you directly on it. You don't have to use chromatics or anything, it's just down the scale and there you land on it. But you have to know your chord scales for doing that, or you have to really relate it back to C major. So that that's where you have to start really thinking in terms of the harmony. Uh, but what I'm going to show you here is an even easier way where you just come down and think, okay, I'm on the A, let's come down, root, seventh, fifth, and then we just play a chromatic passing note to lead into that D. So that's going to be seventh and fifth frets on the D string, then seventh, sixth, and fifth frets on the A string. Dead easy, right? So there, I come up. 
were on the D. So I could have played up, but instead... And that's another piece of vocabulary. So we've got... Now that will work on a minor 7 or a dominant 7 because we've got the flat 7 in there. So there's the root note. It's the flat 7, the minor 7th of the chord. So in terms of chord tones, you could think it's the root, the 7th, and the 5th. And then we're just using a chord tone to pass into that into the D. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one way of looking at it. But of course, if it's a major 7 and you were wanting to move by 5th, you would have to, uh, or down when you're moving root move my fourth you would want to switch that to the to the major seven but it just so happens that we don't have a major seven here we've only got the minor seven uh, and again it's a bit less common when you're moving by fourth from a major seven um so that's now two lines we've got ascending and descending for each of the chord movements in there so from the c to the a we've got or, okay, both are pieces of vocabulary that you can work on, right? Just, just getting used to them, just playing round on those. And then for the movement by fourth, which is the most common movement you're ever going to see, we've either got that one or we've got that one. And those lines, those four lines basically that we've got, will get you through that chord progression round and round and round. And like I said, these look like licks, but think about what actually happens in an, in over time when you're playing through this progression. Let's say we were running it round and round and round, one, six, two, five, one, six, two, five. Well, I'll just play through it slowly. We could play down. So I think, which way am I going to go? Up or down? Let's go down. We're on the A. Well, to get to the D, I don't have a low D on this, so I'm going to have to go up. So let's go up through this one. Then I could come down to the G if I want using that line, you know, but we're using it from the D. So, D, and then, then I'm using that line again to get us up to the C. Oops. Then let's, and then you might think, let's go up on the C to the A. We've got that line. And then go up on the same. Remember, we had two fingerings for that line. We can work, work up the neck. So uh, up to the D. And then maybe I want to come down to the G. Just using that line. And then maybe come down to the C. And that puts us there. So even though it's only four basic lines, the actual lines that happen over time and the, and the overall contour of the line can be anything you want it to be because you can just set off moving come down on that line and it down you just work around all over the neck with that chord progression just using those lines and it just, you know, it sounds a bit jazzy. It works. You're outlining the chord tones. You know, every single one of these is working around that chord tone framework. You got on the, for the one to six. I've got root seventh, fifth. That's all chord tones. Chromatic passing note. You know, on the that one, we've got the chord tone. We've got a leading note, uh, passing note into the chord tone. Chromatic passing note into the chord tone. It's all working around the. It's outlining the harmony. You can hear the chord progression. Actually, that time I came down the scale. The other way that you can come down that I mentioned, where you can come down on a scale, if I'm on the A and I want to come down to the D, I can come down what would essentially be uh, an A natural minor. And then down on the D Dorian, down into the G. That's where knowing the, chords t uh, the chord scales, the appropriate chord scales in there come into play, or just knowing that you're in the key C major and you just play the key, you, you play the notes of C major. So if I'm on the A, I just come down A, G, F, E, D. You know, it's just the notes of C major. So I'm actually, in my mind, I'm just playing the notes of the C major scale and just working around it. So 
do does this make any um sense to everybody that we've just we're building vocabulary we're not thinking too much about chord tones and scales and all that stuff we're just learning a line that we can then apply when we see a particular root movement it's not learning licks as such because these work with different chord qualities and you can use different fingerings for it and you can and you know it's all quarter notes but that is essentially what's happening i used to teach a night class back in the 90s um around that time that I met Scott, actually. I was teaching a night class to uh, about eight or nine bass players. And, um, you know, they were they wanted to... We, the idea was I was going to teach them how to play walking bass. And um, I did it like this. Instead of... Because I knew that a lot of them were going to... They'd get bored if I just sat there saying, C major 7 arpeggio. Okay. Play it chromatically up the neck. Learn your major 7. Okay, next up we have the minor 7 arpeggio. Play it around the neck. Play it around the cycle of fourths. Play that minor 7. Learn the minor 7. Now move on to the dominant 7. If I did that before, I just know that they'd all just either fall asleep or just go. You know, they just wouldn't come back. But by showing them some lines that actually sound pretty funky... They, they were playing music straight away. So this is the beauty of learning vocabulary rather than just learning chord tones and scales and chromatics and then saying, okay, go forth and improvise. Because um, it doesn't work like that. You can't just improvise and make music just by knowing chord tones and scales. It doesn't work like that. You, you have to know phrasing. You have to know how they're applied. You know, it's not enough to just know the nuts and bolts. It's like learning the alphabet and then asking someone to write an essay you know there's more to shakespeare than learning the words and cat dog yes no you know there's more to it than that you have to learn vocabulary and how to create sentences and that's what this is all about and it all starts simple you know and to be honest that line <laughs> has got me through a lot of walking bass lines because it's just a go-to. You you can start thinking a little bit more interesting, especially when you've got um, chords over a longer period of time. Like if uh, if I'm on a D minor seven and it's over four bars, um, well, all right, I'm going to start thinking. I'm I'm not going to be thinking in the same way. I'm not going to be thinking okay D to G. I'm I'm going to be thinking D minor for a while. Okay, you're going to be thinking around that area. But then when it cuts to, let's say that you're on D minor for a while, and then it goes to G, you know. Then you're going to start thinking maybe a bar before. So, and, and, and then it's about learning tunes, isn't it? Then, then you've actually got to start thinking about learning longer progressions and knowing what's going on. But at the heart of it, it's all about learning vocabulary. And I just don't see this talked about enough. <laughs> You know, and even, you know, from me, I, I sit there talking about chord tones and scales and chromatic notes and passing notes and auxiliary notes and all this kind of rubbish. But uh, well, it's not rubbish, but you know what I mean? It's all the nuts and bolts. And you have to know that, you know, at, at the heart of it, you do have to know that stuff. But like I said, there's more to Shakespeare than words and letters. You know, so that's that's where I'm coming from with this. And that's why I didn't want to... Um, necessarily play over a backing track or anything like that i just want you to be listening to and looking at the lines and just think okay chord one to six c to a look at the root movement that's all we did to begin with c to a and it's on a major seven so you know that if it's a c major seven to an a minor seven or a g major seven to an e minor seven a chord one to six because you have to identify that a chord one to six in a key you know that 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 line there will work you just have to transpose it to whichever key you're in so root seventh fifth passing note and up just look for that movement <laughs> you know and if you're on f if you're on e flat you know you just trans you just get used to playing these things in lo over lots of different chords so yeah so that 
is my uh, talk on uh, on vocabulary. Uh, now, with all that in mind, um, I'm actually writing another book. Uh, I'm wondering whether I'm actually going to turn it into more of a course, this one. But uh, I've already written all the baselines and I've already had all the uh, backing tracks created. I'm just finishing off the, uh, the actual lessons themselves in there. But it's a kind of a supplementary thing. Um, a supplement to the walk, simple steps to walking base. So it doesn't do all simple steps to walking base. Does all this stuff that I've just been talking about and everything else. So that's like a full, you know, beginner's guide to being able to play walking bass lines. But I'm writing this book called Walk That Bass or Walk That Bass or whatever the hell I'm going to call it. And all it is is some pre-written walking bass lines. So that's, you know, it's it's over. I think there's five or six different standards. Uh, so you take a chord progression. I've written three two-feel bass lines or four. No, three two-feel bass lines and three four-feel bass lines, as in walking bass lines. So over um, whatever it is, I can't even remember which standards I've done now because <laughs> it was a few months ago when I'd written those out. But um, so, you know, basically, if it was through that one, six, two, five that we just looked at, if I was playing a two-feel... It's that kind of feel. So I've written three different bass lines for each one of those standards. One in a low area, one in this higher area up here, and then one that moves between the two. And the idea is that you learn them as written lines and actually, you know, learn the line. And you'll, and I talk about the vocabulary in the book, and you, the idea is that you will be identifying that vocabulary as you go. Because I'm using limited vocabulary in it. I don't, I don't get too creative. I just use minimal lines and that way you get to identify it as it's going so you'll start seeing things like that you know whatever the line is you'll start to see it in there time and time again and you'll gradually be able to develop your vocabulary you'll develop your repertoire you'll learn how to work through certain other chord progressions like if it's moving from a chord one down to a flat seven or if it's from one down to a you know one up to a secondary dominant on the four or whatever it is right there's um a whole load of that stuff so that book's probably going to come out next month i've got to get it done first but um there'll be some uh, video lessons with it as well so uh yeah hopefully that uh talk on vocabulary has kind of made a bit of sense um because i think a lot of people when they first start looking into playing walking bass lines it just looks hellishly complicated because people are just going to start talking harmony they're going to start talking about you know chord tones and, and chord construction and all that stuff and like i said yes you need to learn that but it was the th i couldn't learn i couldn't play walking bass lines until i went to music college every time i saw something in bass player magazine like a column by john goldsby or joe hubbard or jeff berlin or whoever i'd always read these things and they'd be showing you these walking bass lines. And I had no idea how they were doing it. I'd be like, they'd start talking about the theory of it. And it'd just go completely over my head. I was thinking, how the, how the hell are you supposed to do this on the fly? Oh, my God. You know, you see a chord. Oh, there's a chord progression. Play a walking bass line through it. Bam, 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 bam. At speed. And I'm like, how, how are they doing that? You know, it just seemed like some superpower that they'd got. I didn't realize that you that that you're not thinking of every single note in the same way um you know especially if you're at 250 or 300 beats per minute there's no time to be thinking a b c c sharp d e f f sharp g you don't think like that you're seeing collections of notes you're seeing contours you're seeing root movement you're thinking okay like with that chord progression c it's moving down to the a and you have a rough idea of where you're going you think okay well i can pull that one out a to d you've seen it a million times you've played through the tune a million times the idea is that you practice those things and then you you practice them slowly so that then when somebody pulls it out at 350 beats per minute you can you know use those lines that i've shown you you know that's the same lines and i was talking while i was doing it you just they just fall under your fingers so um yeah that is vocabulary so that's it for the uh supposed seminar let's have a see what everybody's been saying
And like I said, uh, 10th anniversary sale. So if you're really wanting to get into this stuff, the uh, simple steps to walking bass, that's the go-to for it. I mean, I know I'm releasing the book, but really it's a supplemental thing. I mean, you really want to be learning, you know, from that course before you do the book. The book will be a lot cheaper, obviously, but um, I mean, the book is important. You know, you need to learn these pre-composed lines, but if you want to get into the actual nuts and bolts of it, the stuff I was just slagging off, um, then um, that's the uh, that's the course to go for. Cameron says, Washington State, drummer for 30 plus years, started playing bass about a year ago. My oldest daughter's name is also Abigail. She's 18. Oh, man. Um, yeah, eight years from now, she'll be, she's 10 this year, obviously, because of the 10th anniversary. And uh, oh, everybody says that having girls becomes really hard when they get into the teenage years. And uh, yeah, I'm not looking forward to that one. Thanks, Kat from Arkansas. Yeah, me and Scott aren't rivals. I just saw someone say not rivals, just two good shooters. Yeah, we're not rivals at all. I mean, I suppose we are in a sense, but um, I actually asked him. I, I went out for a, uh, a meal with him on, um, when was it? About three weeks ago. Um, and um, just as I was leaving, I was going to catch a train back. And uh, I said, uh, you know, because I'd done the interview with Josh Fosgreen and Charles Vertu, I said, um, oh, you know, everybody was quite happy to see, you know, that we were interacting, you know, bass buzz and talking bass and stuff. And I says, man, everybody would lose their minds if we were talking. And he says, oh, we'll have to do it. And he keeps saying that. But I guarantee if, <laughs> if I ask him, he's going to say no. I can just see it. But maybe he will. I mean, it'd be quite interesting that to have it on, uh, to have Scott on, you know. Um... Mark will bat a divine. TK around too. Yeah, I've got the weight on him, I know. <laughs> My expanding girth. I've just been drinking too much this year. That was the other thing I found as well. You know, I said I found the uh, the photograph of my very first gig that I've put on the blog. Um, so I put that one up, but I also found on one of the other, some random thing. I found, um, footage from the very first, uh, martial arts tournament I was ever in. God, that was weird looking at that, man. Although, you know, it was quite cool because I, I could kick over, over head height, you know, and I could do the splits and all that stuff. So looking at that then, and now looking at me now, I can barely lum in walk, let alone <laughs> kick head height, my, my decaying hips and back. So that was funny seeing that. I'm getting, you know, you find all these people on Facebook and that from your, uh, you know, teenage years and stuff. Yeah, we speak the same accent. Yeah, he's actually from Carlisle, uh, which is up in, uh, originally from Carlisle, which is up in, uh, basically in the Cumbria, it's up in the Lake District. Uh, but it's, oh, I mean, it's just over the way. Uh, I'm from Wakefield, but we both met at Wakefield College, actually. But it's, uh, we're both, you would call us both Leeds lads. You know, our accents are pretty much Leeds. My mum and dad are from Sheffield originally, so I've got a bit of that as well. The way to know our accent is just think of Mel B, Scary Spice, you know, Spice Girls. Think of the scary one with the big frilly hairdo. Her sister was at music college with me, actually. Danielle. But that's a pr that is as Leeds an accent as you'll get, right? Mel B. <laughs> and actually, my um, my accent, if you've ever seen Jane McDonald, uh, the singer that did the cruise thing, it's just probably, you probably don't know if you're in the States, but in England, people know who Jane McDonald is. Um, she's, she's, she's Wakefield. She's, she's got an accent like mine. She, she's from the council estate down the way, or was, not anymore, obviously. And if you really want to know what Wakefield's like, just um, go on YouTube and look up a documentary on a guy called Paul Sykes. <laughs> this complete nutter. That'll give you a good idea of what it's like where I'm from. Look up Paul Sykes. Can't remember what that documentary's called. 
talks about sharks. You'll see that. It's sharks. I am the only man in the history of mankind to swim across the Straits of Zohar. <laughs> so check out that, Paul Sykes. And uh, if you do watch it and you see him, uh, bear in mind that I've had a couple of run-ins over the years with him. He's a complete psychopath. Well, he's dead now, but he was a complete psychopath. He was a boxing heavyweight. Um, he was, well, a gangster and stuff. He's a complete lunatic, or was a lunatic. But, uh, yeah, I've had a couple of run-ins with him. Go a bit further up. God, I'm sweating. You might notice the Geddy Lee thing that I did yesterday with, um, you know, playing uh, YYZ. Oh, my God. Or YYZ, as everybody's saying. Um, I always want to say YYZ. It's just that I get I get inordinate amounts of crap from everybody if I, if I don't do the Americanisms because um, they just don't understand it. <laughs> but we say Z instead of Z. But, uh, you know... It's 90% Americans that watch my stuff, you know, on the analytics. So I have to kind of stay, say that, otherwise they won't understand what the hell I'm talking about. Potato, potato. Thanks, Keith. Your cyborg lessons are fantabulous. Thanks, Sean, for the uh, first time catching the live stream. Okay, so a few people might have had light bulb moments with the vocabulary thing. That's good. Yes, it makes sense. One learns how to speak before doing a grammar course. There you go. So you, you kind of learn these lines and get them under your fingers. Pretty much, well, it, it, it's a little bit different from speech because, of course, you can just talk, you know, with your voice. Whereas with bass, you kind of have to know a little bit of it because there is the added extra of that you're trying to do it over a chord progression. So it's not exactly the same as speech. But it's, um, but in essence, it is speech. Um, it is the same thing, but it's just that you've got this added sort of restriction because of the harmonic side of things. But, um, yeah. How do you decide when you would prefer to use the P-Bass, J or your Sim stuff? Well, uh, uh, for the walking stuff, I tend to do this because I've got flat wounds on here and it sounds very dead. And I can use things like my naughty mute. So if I'm playing that line I just did... So you get that muted tone. Do you think walking into the high register is a possible way to create tension and release when playing a jazz standard? Yes, it is. That, so the, the, you'll find that with every bass line. It doesn't matter what the style is. If you're playing and you're like just a regular old bass line like this, and it comes to a, the end of a four-bar phrase or something like that, you come into the, or the end of a verse, end of a chorus, and you do this... You get added tension on bass by going up into those higher registers. I'll do it again. See what I mean? So when you come up, when I did that line, just using that regular old, um, you know, vocabulary. Up. See, see what I mean? It's, once you get up here, you've got a lot of tension. And then if you come down, so let's say that I came down. Uh, like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Once you get back down here, you know, everything's just blah, 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 bouncing along. But then... See what I mean? It just, it adds the tension. So, uh, yeah, you are correct. In addition to Mark's brilliant courses, Rufus Reed's book is excellent. Yep, Rufus Reed's stuff is great. The sight reading course helped me learn the fretboard. Uh, fretboard. Yep, it's, uh, like I've said before, 
um, reading is the best way to learn your fretboard, but also walking, um, you know, looking through chord progressions, look, reading chord progressions, reading chord charts, creating bass lines up from the chord chart. Uh, because every time, if you see a note on the page and then translate it on the, transfer it to the bass, well, it's like you're having these mini, mini tests all the time. So you're seeing C, where's a C? There's a C, there's an A. Where's an A? There's an A. Wherever it is. You know, whichever, wherever on the instrument. Thanks, Walter. Martin says, I've been a programmer for a while and typing on a keyboard just kind of happens. Does playing bass ever become like that? Where you know what you want to say and it just sort of happens? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it depends on what the style is and, and all that stuff. It's, um, I mean, it does get to a point where you can just pick it up and you just sort of play. Um, I know that technique can, uh, even though it's a bit of a sore topic a lot of the time, because people don't want to think, oh, you've got to practice technique all the time, uh, which you don't. But the more technically adept you are, the less you're going to fight the instrument. So, you know, I practiced technique a hell of a lot when I very first started because I was mad on you know, I was obsessed with Billy Sheehan and people like that. So I just wanted to be like a virtuoso, you know. So I just practiced all that kind of, you know, all that stuff that Charles Bertou, uh practices. That's all the stuff I was doing. And uh, obviously I don't do it anymore. But it, it meant that very early on, I, I, I got so that I could get around the instrument with my fingers. I wasn't fighting the instrument. It was like things weren't going to be taxing. You know, like all that stuff like YYZ and that. It's, I'd have been able to play that after maybe a year or two, maybe, yeah, a year, year and a half, um, because I was just practicing that kind of stuff all the time. So now, I mean, obviously, however long it is now, 33 years later, um, it's, I don't even think of it. I mean, nobody would if you'd been playing that long, really. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, you kind of just... I mean, it depends what you practice, obviously. you could, If you're playing 30 years and you're just playing blues bass lines round and round all the time, then, yeah, you're not going to be able to play death metal. Uh, but it's, um, yeah, just a... It's just a... It's just practice. That's all it is. It's just learning. It's just playing. It's just playing the instrument a lot. And, and to be fair... Not many people do get to practice that amount. It, it, that's why it's good when you start early, uh, you know, when you're a kid, because you've just got nothing else to do. You know, you don't have kids, you don't have this, you don't have that. You can just pff, spend all your time just practicing. And that's what I did. That's what everybody does when they're a kid, when you start playing. Just play, play, play. Later on, kids come into the, you've got a job, whatever it is. You just don't have the time. So like 10 minutes is really valuable when you get older. But, like, I'd be practicing for, like, eight, nine, ten hours a day when I was younger because I had literally nothing else to do apart from play computer games. You know, that was all I did for a, a few years. You know, I mean, obviously not too long, but between the age of, let's say, 15 and 20. Uh, well, actually, I was 18 when I started music college, and that was when I started practicing so much because it wasn't just practice. It wasn't physical practice. I was studying as well. So I might be writing an essay. I might be analyzing a, a, a you know, a composition or writing a composition or whatever, doing theory, oral, blah, 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 learning pieces, um, all the stuff that I'd be given in the bass lessons, all of that stuff. It was just like 24 seven music, you know, cause I'd be in college. I'd, I'd get up, I'd practice before I went in. So I'd wake up about seven, I'd, uh, you know, I'd get up about seven, I'd practice before I went in, I'd be in for like nine, we'd have lessons until like five o'clock, and then I'd get home, have something to eat, and then I'd just practice or do whatever the homework was until I went to bed, and I did that for five years, and it, so it's just non-stop, you can't, you can't really do that when you're, you know, when you have a job, and you've got kids, and you've got responsibilities, and just when you get old, you just can't be asked. you know, which is kind of what I'm like now, um, you know, my playing back then would have been way better than it is now. I just don't, I, I don't have the time. So it's, you know, my chops are just terrible these days. I just, you know, ask me to play hard, most things and I'm, you know, I have to, all right, I can get by with mo with most stuff, but not, not like when you're practicing all that amount of time. 
so yeah my chops my uh, i'll tell you what's really bad these days is my calluses if i had to start doing loads and loads of gigs if i were gigging uh, seven nights a week again it'd take me a couple of weeks uh, probably a yeah a couple of weeks to get my calluses back because they're just terrible i used to have really hard calluses you know but now i've just got basic you know non-gigging calluses because i just don't gig enough What's the width of your strap? I'm working about online. Uh, it's a uh, uh, this one is actually a Minotaur strap or Minotaur strap, um, but I generally like Levy's leathers ones, which are um, uh, 4.5 inch ones that I get. I get the widest ones I can get because, as I've talked about it before, I had incredible back problems from playing too much, so I could barely walk, and um, so I, I'm. I'm massively into light gear now. Uh, I mean, luckily now you can just use in-ear monitors most of the time. I've got amps like this back here that are, I can lift with my little finger, literally. I can, that, that's so light. Um, I like light bases and I like big thick straps because, you know, people like to sit there saying, oh, you can't beat an amp like SVT and ah, you can't, you know, the light is bad. You know, you don't want to be using things that have got like, uh, I mean, it's, but then don't know. Honestly, anybody that says that has never gigged as much as me. I, I I guarantee that because I'm not a wimp, you know, like I've done, <laughs> I've spent a lot of time in gyms and things like that. It's like, you know, I've I've got strength to me and, and dexterity. Like I said, I used to be able to do the splits and stuff. I used to do all this martial arts. I can lift stuff. I've got like enough muscle mass to be able to do things. But man, my back... It was. It took a pasting. Um, you know, it's it's a combination of several things when you when you're a musician. Like back when I was doing that a lot, you know, you'd get in a van. There'd be like a bunch of you. The band gets in the van. You put pile all the stuff in the back of this transit van. You you sit there. It could be a two hundred mile drive to wherever you're gonna go. All there, scrunched up in some van, and then you get out. And what's the first thing that you do? You get all your gear out to put it in this in the in the place heavy gear do you warm up do you stretch no you just get out you start banging it out it could be really bad weather and so you're just cold you just get it all out and then that that doesn't help but also playing you know five to seven sets every single day for like nine months out of the year uh, which was what i was doing on those cruise gigs for like well that was like 10 to 12 years of that it just destroyed my back um i'm two inches shorter than i used to be i used to be five foot eleven and a half and now i'm five foot nine and a half it's like a friend of mine came down uh it was my best man i've talked about him in the bio um we were the same height and he's towers above me now my brother i was always the tall one i was a lot taller than him he's as tall if not taller than me now i've just lost the height because of the basically this shoulder was taking all the hammer and uh of course, the muscle down on the other, on the opposing side, was kind of out of balance with it, and it just pushed my back out so that it just got so bent, and um, it just got worse and worse and worse. So much I couldn't sneeze without um, going into a fetal position. I just, I just wanted to cry. It was awful. It's really bad back. And eventually, when I mean, every time I saw anybody about it, I'd go see chiropractors and things like that, and they'd say, "Well, if you keep doing it." there's nothing we can do about it all you can do is just try and maintain it and um eventually i went to a sports physio uh, about 2000 and it was just after i started talking bass and he was like a just my savior he showed me a lot of um exercises to do a lot of them are pilates exercises um and we got a lot of things for helping um we used a lot of lumbar rolls for when I'm sat down and things. Uh, and then gradually got this um, physiotherapy um, routine together. And I wouldn't say that I'm 100% better now, but I'm not in pain like I used to be. And um, yeah, it was just horrendous. So whenever anybody starts talking about that kind of stuff and says, oh, yeah, no, this light gear, you know, they're just all wimps and stuff. I'm thinking, man, you have no idea. 
you just you don't gig enough well what are you talking about i do two sets of i do two sets a week me i do three sets a week. and it's like that's nothing you want to try doing every single day every, for month upon month year upon year with heavy instruments and then moving heavy gear around it is it, it kills your back so like i said i now use uh, because the one that killed me was the marcus miller signature bass it's a uh, 10 to 11 pounds so it's not as heavy as like a seven string conklin or something like that but it's heavy enough um if you were to hold it you know if i hand it to anybody they go bloody hell that's a heavy one and um so i was using that all uh, you know all through that and i loved it i mean it's it great, great tone and everything but man it's a bad bass to use when you're doing all those sets and i mean even a light bass of like maybe nine pounds eight pounds seven pounds um seven hours a day of playing every single day is still gonna you know you know women with handbags you know you, they all talk about you know wearing high heels and having handbags and they end up with back problems so you can imagine what it's like with a bass so yeah like i say anybody that starts set, uh, talking like that I, i've seen them on top bass i once had an argument with somebody on top bass i think long ago and i was like you have no idea mate and they didn't like that because i was condescending but it's worth being condescending with people like that when they actually think that heavy gear is uh, better than light gear. And I'll argue that one till the cows come home. All that digression just from the what's the type of strap you're using. do these i'll get by I'll, I'll get off in a minute i'll just so if you've got any last questions or anything just bang them out there and i'll try and answer as much as i can before i go my wife is going out tonight to two different uh get togethers and i need to get back for a thanks keith Uh, you mentioned pictures on the blog. Is it available through the Talking Bears website? I don't see it. Um, uh, yes, it is. Let me just, while I'm here, let me see what link I've got on there. I mean, you'll have the email. I sent it out on the emails. Uh, History of Talking Bears. If you go down into the footer on the main site, it's there. There's a recent post and you'll see it. But I'll tell you what, I'll put the link to it here. It's not on in the members area. It's on the actual... Uh, main site it's there i put it down in the comments at the bottom paul sykes was meant to fight mclean yes he was lenny mclean that is or mclean as he liked to be called uh yeah paul sykes uh, paul sykes did a, a beating him uh because he was a he was a legit you know heavyweight contender he used to spar with joe frazier and uh um who else did he used to spar with um i've seen him with um I can't remember, but he, um, yeah, he was a, he was a good fighter, but he was also a psychopath and a, you know, complete and a sociopath. He was, he was just nuts. And he'd, he'd walk in uh, pubs, right? In Wakefield. This is, this is kind of guy he was. He'd walk in and he'd go up to a guy, might be stood there with his wife, whatever. They've gone out for a nice night. He comes in, he walks up to someone's drink, goes up to it and spits in it and then puts it down just to provoke people into fights. And I've heard loads of really, really bad stuff about some of the things that he used to do. I won't repeat them here, but uh, yeah, he used to do some really dodgy stuff. And he was like him with the mob and all that, you know. And he was in prison for like 25 years before he even started fighting. <laughs> Dude was a lunatic. But yeah, I've had a couple of run-ins with him. Once he was, oh, I was on a bus. Coming back from Leeds College of Music, actually, back into Wakefield. And he was on the back of the bus. Nobody else on the top deck of the bus because everybody... <laughs> It was like, it was obvious. You know, he sat there drinking Kestrel Super Strength Lager with his mate. And he'd already got a cut above his eye. He got blood running down his face. He'd already been scrapping in um, Leeds. And I comes upstairs and I'm like, oh my God. So I just sat down and then he he's, he kept saying stuff, trying to provoke it from the back. But he was too hammered to really get up. And then as I got up to go down, he was getting off at the same stop as me. And he came up behind me and he's like 6'4", you know, he was like huge guy massive hands huge. i've got big hands i mean they were massive 
And um, he's like, they're going, oh, I could still have these young lads. Look at him. You know, and he just started whispering in my ear, started doing this. And I'm like, man, I need to get the hell out of here. And, oh, I've got loads of stories about Paul Sykes. But he was a tramp after all, like a hobo for, um, you know, he, was a, he, he just ended up being homeless, just living on the streets in Wakefield. And, uh, yeah, I used to see him almost every day when I used to go down into the town. He was just covered in mess. He was just, you know soiling himself you know it was uh but he'd still start they used to get kids used to go up and they used to set fire to the, at one point they put lighter fluid on him and set fire to him he was terrible terrible how it came to an end because he was um they didn't kill him with that he was, they just used to go you know he had a really bad end but karma really he'd been doing all that stuff anyway that's paul sykes that's wakefield for you <laughs> Because I once had somebody asking this, they said, who are you from a, a nice affluent area in uh, England? And it's like, man, do I sound like it? <laughs> it's like, this is my voice, mate. You know, it, Wakefield is not probably what you think it is. Um... Is a walking bass line and a pedaling bass line the same thing or different? A pedaling bass line would be this. You know, and a walking bass line. I get it about the light weights. I just refuse to play a bass that weighs more than six pounds. I found the uh, Glary um, Gib Burley Wood four string bass that weighs five pounds. Man, that would be a dream. Oh, I'd love that. Had issues after years of weightlifting and Apkido destroyed me for years. Yeah. And actually, when I went to see uh, somebody about all those Pilates things, they said that actually they sometimes see people that had done martial arts in the um, uh, in their earlier years um, having problems later on because of some of the stuff that you do when you're younger. Uh, I mean, I'd given it up by 20, you know, but... Um, it was, yeah, to, to, my body took a little bit of a battering from some of it. I mean, not like, you know, UFC fighters and boxers that are just getting hammered all the time, you know. But it was still, it was, um, yeah, it, it, like my legs and my hips in particular suffered quite a bit. Um, four pounds, man, that'd be good. I mean, I've got the, um, Gretsch and the Sire short scales, and they're, they're very light as well. The Sire's actually not that light for a short scale, but the Gretsch is incredibly light. That's like playing a ukulele. Yeah, everybody's got these light basses, man. Uh, and like I said, that that Fender Jazz, that Marcus Miller, it's and they're not all like that. I felt Marcus Miller signatures that have been light, but you know they're not all the same. Manufacturers, they don't always they're not always the same weights. So that one I had, it was eleven pounds. I think it was eleven pounds or ten and a half. It was ten in between ten and eleven. Which for a four string jazz, I mean, I know that I sometimes see people saying, "Oh, I had a precision that were fourteen pounds and stuff." I mean, man. I just wouldn't want to deal with that. You know, a Stingray that's that. You know, 70s basses were the real ones. You know, like, you get, like, precisions from that period that are just really heavy. But, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't have mattered if I wasn't playing so much. If I were only doing two gigs a week, no problems. You know, because I just get all the rest of the time to actually recover. But when you're playing all day... You know, that was the problem because they were getting the reason I was doing so much is because on that damn shit, the, the one where it really hit was when they were having us, uh, we were out in the Caribbean and they were getting us to do, I don't know why they did this. They had us doing two deck sets in the day. You know, everybody's trying to sunbathe outside and they're getting us to get up there and start banging out hits, um, you know, banging out pop music to a bunch of people that are trying to read books and, and sunbathe. And there we are, party time. Whee! two sets of that in the afternoon so you might do midday and then you might do two o'clock and then they'd have us move in and do the pre-dinners so they have two dinner sitting so we do like 5 45 and then 7 45 and then starting at nine o'clock you do the the three sets then the three hour sets so 
So you've got your two deck sets, you've got your two pre-dinners, that's four, and then you've got the three on a night. Now, it wasn't always seven. On a good day, we'd just have two pre-dinners and then the three sets. So that'd just be five. So it'd be five on those days. And if we had a really good day, you might only get three. But, um, I mean, it was in between five and seven every day. And, of course, you didn't get days off hardly. I mean, things changed a bit over the years. At some points, we did start getting a night off every i think we get a night off once a contract no once a a leg or once a uh, a month something like that but then um but when i very first started you didn't get any days off if you got a day off it was just because because something had happened you know you've got hit by a rogue wave and everything's gone which has happened actually we once hit some really rough sea and then we had to um everything got cancelled so we were all like well hey all, all passengers are freaking out and we're all just happy that we're not playing and um or um you know there'll be something somebody's ill somebody something's happened uh, you know when you're playing that amount you know there's a lot of different factors that come into play uh, especially when you're playing for as long doing that as long as i did and um yeah just so you can imagine just that amount of playing and a lot of people think, oh, that must be amazing playing that amount. I'm telling you, if you play that much in that kind of environment, as great as it was, and as, you know, I had a constant tan, and it was like, you know, I was young and free and single, it was wicked, in terms of it being a little bit like a holiday in some aspects. But the playing side of it, I just didn't want to touch my instrument. When we used to have a, a at the end of the contract, we might have like three to four weeks off. I'd leave, either leave the base somewhere on the ship so I didn't have to bring it off. Or I'd just put it somewhere when I got back and I wouldn't touch it. I just didn't want to play. I didn't want to even listen to music. How depressing is that? I was just like, I hated doing music in the time off because it was like we were doing it so much. It was like all the time. And so the last thing I wanted was to sit there playing. You know, it was like, get that thing away from me. And it was really depressing. So much so that when I finished, around the time that I started talking bass, I was, I'd had enough. I, I just... In that bio, I talk about how I was going to stop playing and I was actually going to get an office job or something like that. Well, yeah, part of it was because we needed the cash and I and, and you know there was wasn't really any gigs around here anyway. But one of the things was I was just burned out. I was just like so jaded. But then when I started doing this again, it took me back to being a, a player again and actually enjoying it, playing stuff because I wanted to do it. So that was great. So now. I actually love playing, you know, I've started learning all the old classical pieces again, which I used to do when I was younger. So I I now, it's kind of put me back in that teenage mindset, which I'd lost completely when I was doing those cruise gigs. It's not so bad when you're just doing regular uh, work, you know, on land, you know. So if I was doing like function work, uh, whatever it is, session work, whatever the stuff, you know, because it was all kinds of different gigs. You know, sometimes it's like a big band, sometimes it's like a jazz band, a cocktail band, a function band, a whatever it is. Um, that's quite interesting because sometimes, it, because a lot of the time it's different. You get to do different stuff, you meet different people. It's it's not as regimented. When you do cruise work, it's it's an, it's like an office job. It's like a nine to five, but music. So it's, um, <laughs> on the face of it, it sounds great, but it is for a while and then eventually it's everything else it's like all the other side of stuff i actually enjoyed <laughs> ironically it's like i was just waiting to get off stage so i'd be there thinking about having a pint afterwards you know we're thinking about like whatever it was whatever sordid things were going on it was more i was thinking about that playing i had no interest in at all i looked like i did maybe on stage although people always say that i look depressed but it's, uh, you know, I wasn't depressed. But um, <laughs> it's, um, yeah. So anyway, that's the that's the cruise gigs. Okay, so it started raining now. Um, oh my God, it's chucking it down. Okay, I will get moving. I'll get back so that my missus can uh, go out because I'll be looking after the kids. And uh, like I said... 10th anniversary of Talking Bass, so woohoo! We've got the, uh, I've got the blog up talking about the history of it. We've got the sale on. So if you want to do the walking stuff that was just talking about, there's the Simple Steps to Walking Bass course. We've got Cotto and Essentials. We've got all them courses. I'm sure that you've, I've, <laughs> you know all about my courses. Um, and um, 
Yeah, so I'll be doing another one of these on um, when Monday. So I'll be doing a Monday one and one on Wednesday as well. So I'm gonna for the duration of this anniversary thing, I'm gonna be doing one uh, three a week. So yeah, so if you come by, for, so just in case you don't see the email or something, it'll probably for those of you in America, it will probably be Monday morning. So it's gonna be like nine in the morning or something like that i know a lot of people are going to be at work but i can't if i was to do it at a time when nobody was at work in america i'd have to do it at one o'clock in the morning and trust me i wouldn't be uh, very good at that we we get up at five every morning with our with our two-year-old so <laughs> you can just imagine what that'd be like so um all right then everybody i will see you all hopefully on monday so see you later